All right. Uh, I think we're back and we're muted over there. So uh, welcome to the last session. Um, this is uh, 5 p.m. for us here on the East Coast of uh, North America. Uh, but this is the uh, well-being and urban analytics session. And I will pass it over to uh, Vanessa to get things going. Thanks, Grant. Malcolm will get us started. I'll do the introduction. So no my hurry my. Uh, welcome to the University of Canterbury, um, Kirikoto, Co Malcolm Campbell, Togo Inoue. So welcome to this session on um, urban and well-being analytics. So organized by Vanessa, myself, um, and Lindsay Conroe as well. So we thought it would be really valuable just to kind of um, put together a session, sort of to, to showcase what's going on in New Zealand um, to a more international audience. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say, thank you to all the speakers um so uh david o'sullivan from victoria university of wellington um ek from lyser in luxembourg um philip um, from the national university of singapore and shravida from um uh, the ministry of transport so we've got a, a range of topics really around the thematic area of urban and well-being analytics it feels really weird to kind of talk to people in the room and on screen at the same time. So hopefully, hopefully that comes across um, reasonably well. Uh, I'm hoping that you've read the session outline so that you can know roughly what to expect. So I'm not going to say um, very much more about that. We have a series of four talks from our speakers. Um, they last for about a very precise 12 minutes. Um, <laughs> something around that order um, and I'm hoping that the speakers will seamlessly slot in and out of um, position um, and that will make it run uh, hopefully quite easily. Uh, right at the end we have around five minutes just for discussion of whatever kind of things pop up during the session um, and to summarize and close and then for those of you who are present here at the University of Canterbury we have um, coffee and a poster session afterwards uh, and then a few more talks during the rest of the day as well um, so that's pretty much all from me um, I'm happy to pass across um, to David whenever he's ready um, and then I'll mute myself um, and hopefully it runs itself reasonably well well uh, thank you Malcolm I my screen tells me that I'm presenting. Can my slides be seen? We we can see your slides. You yeah. can see my slides. Okay, so I'll I'll get started since I have twelve minutes apparently. Um, it looks to me I'm David O'Sullivan from Tohiringawaka to a University of Wellington. It's a great pleasure to present. I was not expecting quite as large an audience as this, so that is. Um, very nice. It seems to me like uh, the topic of my slides might be a better fit with some of the conversation that was going on toward the end of the last session, which I, I sort of stumbled in upon a few minutes ago. Um, uh, so let's just get into it. Um, what I want to reflect on is, is this kind of, um, as it were, I have my talk here from GI science via spatial data science to geographical computing. What I want to ask people to reflect on here really is, uh, I don't know that we are standing at a crossroads exactly, but uh, there's certainly been a big shift in the last few years towards talking about many of the things that we do as spatial data science rather than as geographical information science. And I guess I have some, I have uh, not concerns exactly, but I have some questions that I'd like us to consider in relation to that. Um, one of them, obviously, of, of my advanced age is nostalgia for the days of the single unitary platform of GIS uh, back in the back in the computer labs in in um, before the turn of the millennium. But actually, more seriously, what I'm concerned about is these two questions: why, why are we talking about data rather than information, and why are we talking about spatial rather than geographical? Um, so I'm going to talk about each of those in turn and raise a couple of, you know, some questions and concerns, some of it leaning into a kind of a history as much as looking forward. Then I want to look forward um, 
considering my own work rather than any rather than the broader fields as such and and then uh, I'll finish so uh, the the question of data versus information is actually a pretty old one um, anybody who's read at all in the history of GIS particularly if you've picked up on the critical GIS um, story uh, has probably encountered these rather grumpy arguments between Stan Openshaw and Peter Taylor back in the 90s. Um, possibly not terribly illuminating, um, and but really revolving around a question that was raised by Peter Taylor in an earlier paper uh, called slightly um, uninformatively GKS, which actually stands for Geographical Knowledge Systems. And the question that Peter Taylor was posing then was, you know, why, why are we stepping back from an aspiration to creating knowledge rather than creating and handling information? And I think that question is a reasonable one to pose again, as we sort of, uh, you know, stand on the brink, as it were, of beginning to think about ourselves as doing spatial data science rather than geographical information science. Data, to my mind, seems like a, an even more of a retreat uh, from knowledge. And if what we're really about is um, creating and growing knowledge, then perhaps we should be thinking about about these questions raised by Peter Taylor. Now, I, I think there is work in this space that we can refer to. I find uh, this book slightly, perhaps surprising title, um, really grapples with the question of what data are and where data come from and um, takes seriously the question of data in relation to information and knowledge and also the social structures and political contexts in which data are made and used and deployed. So I'm not going to kind of I'm not going to um, spend any more time on this question of information versus data. But I think it is actually something that we should um, think pretty seriously about if if we are indeed um, becoming spatial data scientists and not uh, geographical information scientists. So this other question. Um, geographers have been fond for a very long time of saying that spatial is special. Um, but what spatial isn't, I would suggest, is it's not geographical. Now, this isn't really uh, something that geographical information science has, has handled especially well. Um, the real, the, there's a real emphasis in a lot of geographical information science on sort of space as location space as XY coordinates or latitude longitude coordinates, which is not really geographical, because what I would suggest is geographical are a whole slew of, um, if you like, big ideas for thinking geographically, uh, scale and the, the sort of binary of space and place and notions like territory and region and locale and neighborhood and the way things are organized in space and different conceptions of distance and so on and so forth. So geography offers up this kind of um, enormous range of, of concepts and to a greater or less extent, geographical information science has attempted to grapple with some of those notions, but very often has, has um, not tried very hard perhaps. And maybe that's unfair, but um, Geographical information science has very much emphasized location as in coordinate pairs and location on Earth's surface over some of these richer concepts. Um, but spatial data science in, fra in being framed as spatial data science, I think is, is an even greater danger of falling into this um, trap identified um, 20 years ago at this point by Harvey Miller and Libby Wentz in a really interesting paper in the annals of Association of American Geographers, where they suggest that because of this reliance on the notion of location in a, in a Euclidean space, many researchers, now this isn't necessarily a critique of geographical information science per se, so much as a critique of the primary platforms that have been built by geographical information science, namely GIS, um, that, and this is key here, rather than locking researchers into a single representation, GIS could serve as a toolkit for exploring alternative geographic representations and their possibilities. So that's really what I'm 
what I'm concerned by is if we overemphasize the notion of spatial as kind of captured by the by coordinate pairs or coordinate triples uh, or possibly even uh, x, y, z, t, um, then I think we we forego the possibility of much richer ways of thinking about geography. Uh, this is a kind of a, a framing of this notion that I, I, along with others, presented a few years ago at Geographical Information Science in actually in Montreal, I believe, um, suggesting that there are a lot of there are a lot more connections between GI science and geography than we perhaps imagine. We sometimes use different language, but we're often dealing with the same concepts or very similar concepts. We're, de we're dealing with the same concepts, but in different ways. Nothing wrong with that per se, but we could make those links and uh, stronger. So what next? Well, I can only really speak to the kind of things that I've been doing um, rather than the community at large. Um, I would, um, I've been really intrigued uh, about the idea of thinking about space relationally rather than in these absolute coordinate terms so that we move from representations such as this of uh, airline networks to something like this, which is a redrawing of a graph display. You won't be able to see any of the detail here, but what this emphasizes is the kind of central hub um, airports in on the sort of coastal US and uh, Asia, Auckland is done here, I think. So New Zealand, even in this rep in this representation, Auckland and New Zealand are on the periphery, um, which is perhaps not surprising. But thinking about space relationally, not absolutely. Extending that further to thinking about ways in which we can generalize the notion of projection. This is a very old idea. Um, this is uh, travel times in Seattle, uh, estimated from OSMNX data. Uh, and then remaking the map so that those isochrones of equal travel time become circular. And then we're kind of able to conceptualize that as a map projection. And we've been working on ways of kind of inserting this into mainstream platforms via by kind of hacking, hacking proj. Um, and then finally, another example from, well, not finally, my, another example from my own work, multivariate mapping using weaving as a concept where we break break from the concept of um, fixed uh, boundary polygons. Um, and then yet another thing that I'm probably known for, maybe uh, computational models, not mathematical models. So this is an example of work uh, we did during the early days of the pandemic, modeling uh, geography as dynamic. Obviously not the only person doing that kind of thing, but the bigger point here is that we're moving, I think, to an era of many tools to think with and not one platform. That kind of dominance of, of GIS as a single unitary platform with one particular way of thinking about space uh, is, I hope, past. And the positive spin I put on spatial data science is that we're, we're, we're transitioning to that world rather than the single platform. Uh, I have um, some uh, broader thoughts on this in a book that's coming out soon, uh, Computing Geographically Build Bridging GI Science and Geography, which reflects on this idea of uh, concepts and geography and how they show up in GI science or not. Um, and I think I will stop there. Thank you for your attention. Our next presenter now is Philip Vilcek, which I'm probably mispronouncing the name, so I apologize in advance for that. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about novel use cases of street level imagery for urban analytics. Please, Philip. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, no problem. Uh, Your floor. Hi, everyone. Uh, hello from Singapore. It's 5.30 a.m., so forgive me if I'm a, still a bit sleepy. Uh, so many thanks for organizing this event, and, uh, and uh, I'm really glad to be here. So I'll use my slot of 12 minutes to present what my research group is doing in the domain of street level uh, imagery. And uh, I'd like to first introduce my group because most of the work is done by my uh, 
by my colleagues and, and students. So we are a group of about 20 researchers located in Singapore in Southeast Asia. And our mission is to break the silos between uh, GIS and different disciplines like uh, planning. And when doing that, we specialize in uh, new kinds of urban data like uh, 3D city models, infrared thermography, and street level imagery. Of course, we deal with uh, geo AI and uh, we are also focusing on crowdsourcing. So now I'd like to talk about uh, one of our main focuses and that's street level imagery, which has gained quite some attention in the last uh, 10 years in the domain of urban data science and also GIS science. So I think most of you know about uh, street level imagery from Google Street View. Uh, they have been working on this for more than 15 years. They've done an amazing job. They collected more than 200 billion images from thousands of cities around the world. And this data is of high quality. And we in Singapore are using it for uh, many different purposes, like many other research groups around the world. For example, we are using it for uh, human perception, uh, um, we are using it to map infrastructure, for example, mapping uh, street furniture and other urban elements that you cannot see from satellite images. We are also uh, using it to understand human activities. And most commonly, also like many other groups around the world, we are using it to map the urban form. So we are using the the computer vision techniques like um, image segmentation and then map uh, elements like visible greenery at the pedestrian level, amount of visible buildings, and, and most importantly, uh, the, the, the exposure of the sky. And um, this data is usually aggregated, just to give you one example of a use case. And uh, we work on urban scale analysis, such as uh, understanding what is the exposure to the sky across a city, and this kind of data is quite useful for many different domains like uh, urban climate, uh, real estate, and so on. And uh, in this presentation, I'd like to um, introduce you to two recent developments that we have been working on using Street View imagery. So we have introduced uh, two new use cases. Both of them got published in uh, journals. One of them was published in Landscape and Urban Planning. The other one was published in uh, Computers, Environment, and Urban Systems. So the first one is on uh, revealing spatial temporal evolution of urban visual environments. The goal was to uh, use Street View imagery to automatically detect typical scenes in a single city. So in this research, that was led by one of our graduate students, Liang Xiaocheng. We develop a workflow that gathers thousands of images from uh, Google Street View and other services, and one that automatically clusters typical scenes that you can see in a particular city. So this is an example for uh, Singapore. Our workflow has detected uh, six clusters of typical streetscapes that you can see in uh, Singapore. And at the moment, we are working on deploying this method also in other cities. And because we do this at the city scale, this uh, enables us to understand what is the spatial distribution of these typical streetscapes um, across the city. So, for example, in the case of Singapore, if you look at the, at the center of the city, you will see that cluster one dominates. And if you go back to uh, the previous slide, if you look at what cluster one represents, it represents a type of a streetscape that we call um, urban jungle. And this is a typical visual streetscape that you can see in the city center of Singapore. So that's a new, new use case that we have introduced to help designers understand how cities have been designed and built, but also understand the spatial distribution of different uh, designs. In this research, while we have been working on sourcing data, we also noticed that uh, 
For many cities around the world, Google has also historical images. So Google started collecting this kind of data many years ago. And in many cities, like it is the case for Singapore, they started uh, doing that more than 10 years ago. And, and in the meantime, they have been revisiting the city and mapping it all over again. So we downloaded this historical data from three different periods, from 2008, from 2015, and 2021. And we run this clustering approach for all these three periods independently. And using our technique, we have also detected major changes in the city. So we have uh, been uh, understanding which of the streets have changed the most thanks to this, thanks to the availability of this kind of uh, temporal uh, imagery. So some streets in the city became greener thanks to planning interventions by the government. Uh, some of them uh, got new buildings uh, constructed and so on. And this is the first time that street view imagery has been used uh, to detect uh, changes in streetscapes. And uh, <clears throat> we believe that with this use case, we introduced a new way to understand how cities uh, have changed in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, depending uh, the span of the data you have available. So this plot shows the quantity of particular clusters uh, and their change over the last uh, 15 years. So you can understand how some clusters, like cluster 4, has expanded. And just to remind you what cluster 4 is, uh, if you look at the top right, cluster 4 is a typical Singaporean uh, residential uh, estate uh, with a lot of greenery. So this kind of research can also be used to validate government interventions because that's exactly what uh, the local government here has been working on. They've been working on building more residential estates like this one. And uh, this is what our technique uh, confirms. So that's the first research. And the second one, which I'd like to conclude my presentation with, is about noise. So uh, lots of uh, cities around the world have been impacted by different kinds of noise, like traffic noise, industrial noise, and so on. And, uh, and uh, creating this uh, uh, and, and understanding noise it has been a bit difficult. So for example, many cities have been attempting to create noise maps. Uh, they've been using field measurements. They've been using expensive simulation software. And not many cities have actually succeeded in creating noise maps because it's complicated and, and quite expensive. And we started this research on understanding how can we use street view imagery to predict urban noise. So we have uh, shown that it's possible to turn basically street view images into noise. We found that they can be a new instrument to sense uh, noise in cities and can help bypass field measurements and be an alternative to simulations. And besides the intensity of noise, we found that we can predict also the type of the noise, like traffic noise, nature noise, and so on. So we trained um, a model that takes images across the city. In this case, we used 200,000 of them. And for each district, we did this actually at the um, 200 meter resolution. We can predict the intensity of noise based on the different elements that are visible in the image. And we validated this method on uh, 80 locations across Singapore, and we found a moderately strong uh, correlation. Also, we deployed this method in other cities. So we focused uh, on Shenzhen in China. And we have created different maps for different kinds of noise, like not only traffic noise, but natural noise and so on. So uh, I'm, I use my 12 minutes. I'd like to conclude this presentation by, by stating that street level imagery is still relatively new and emerging, but it has been quite well established in the community in the last decade. And we believe it's here to stay. Uh, 
most of the papers we see are focusing on the same use cases, like mapping the urban form, understanding perception, but we think there is also a lot of potential for uncovering new use cases like we are working on at the moment. And if you're interested in this uh, topic, I'd like to advertise the session organized by my PhD students that will start in about 15 uh, hours. So thanks for having me here and I would welcome questions later. Thank you, I can hear the clapping. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so if you have a question, just pop it in the Q&A. And uh, our next speaker is Reed Ravi, and she will talk about exploring walkability in a hilly city with spatial data science. <laughs> Thank you, Vanessa. So, <clears throat> as she introduced, I'm uh, Shriv. I'm working in the public sector here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and it's the Ministry of Transport. Um, what I'm going to present to you today, though, is uh, nothing that I do in my day-to-day -day work. Um, it's uh, effectively a citizen spatial data science project that I did um, just out of interest being a, an urban citizen in Wellington, um, which is the capital city of New Zealand. So what, I what I'd like to talk to you about is, yeah, how do you explore a city um, with urban spatial data science um, and especially interested in how walkable the city is because that relates to a lot of my day-to-day -day experience as somebody who really enjoys walking um, either to work or uh, to the local shops and so on. So what does a hilly city look like? I think um, most of us live um, in probably relatively flat cities. That was certainly my experience until I moved to New Zealand, um, where we first came to Wellington and we realized, gosh, it is actually quite hard to walk around in our neighborhood. And um, it is incredibly hilly. It, the hills themselves are not very high. They're between 200 and 300 meters, but they're quite steep because they sort of rise pretty sharply from um, right from the coast. Um, and you can see that in the picture on the left, which I took on one of my hilly walks um, around the suburbs. It's a southern suburb and it's looking north. Um, and what you can see is you see the Wellington Harbour, <clears throat> but you also see CBD in the centre left. And, um, you know, you see sort of uh, there's a decay in tall buildings um, and then the sort of hills all around are kind of dotted um, with small buildings and those are largely uh, houses. So that's the, the life in Wellington. It's a little, um, you know, it's bifurcated. There's a sort of urban, dense urban center um, in these flat areas. And then you kind of have a suburban living that extends out into the, the hills, um, you know, both the north, the west, the east and the south. And um, on the right, you see that actually a lot of the flat land that we have in the city, including the central business district, um, were actually uplifted by seismic activity in the recent past. So it's a very precious resource in the city. And so, you know, where, where possible, it's used for um, kind of high density living, but also for things like our international airport and industrial areas. So when we look at what that means in terms of the street network, how do these hills affect the gradients of the city? Um, it's it's quite stark. So you see the slope class based on um, the, the gradient. It's sort of uh, classified into about six or seven different classes with uh, the greens being the sort of easily walkable sort of flat more mild slopes uh, within 5%. Um, and then anything sort of orange and above is getting progressively harder to walk on. And what really stands out for Wellington is just the vast amount of reds that um, you see across the city. Um, there's sort of bands of green, and these correspond largely to those uh, uplifted areas that I shared in the previous photos. So that's where the sort of earthquakes pushed up quite a lot of flat, flat land. Um, and when you look at the proportion of um, hilly streets, um, you really see 56% uh, of them are at least of medium slope in the city. So you just have, yeah, over, a, over half of our streets are hilly and relatively hard to walk on, depending, of course, on who you are. Uh, just a quick comparison to what some other familiar cities might be like. Um, there's, we've got Lisbon and Leeds, uh, which uh, have their hilly areas sort of distributed around the city, but there's, you know, vast expanses of flat um, or sort of mild gradient. Um, Zurich is probably a little bit hillier than the, than the other two, but again, 
you know, you see the expanse of green is also considerable. So very qualitative comparisons, of course, but probably want a systematic one to know exactly how much, um, how, how many streets or what proportion of streets are, are um, hard to walk on in these streets uh, from an, uh, just using the slope class. But Wellington, by comparison, has just got a ton of red um, in the street network. Um, it's especially striking when you consider residential streets because of that um, urban sort of uh, form change between the central flat area, which is high density, and the sort of outlying hilly areas, which are lower density suburban living. So when you look at residential streets, the proportion of uh, steep inclines is considerably higher. So in the, when you look at all of the streets of the city, you get 56% that are of medium grade or higher. But when you're looking at residential streets, it's two thirds or so 67% of streets are of medium slope and higher. So only a third are really kind of quote unquote easily walkable. And that poses, you know, considerable challenges for most of us who live out in the, in the hilly suburbs. How, you know, what is, what is walking like? And to get a sort of a sense of this in terms of the potential of local uh, walking in Wellington, we use this proxy of the council playgrounds. Um, so the city council provides um, <clears throat> just uh, playgrounds dotted all across the city with about a 600 meter catchment. And it's a nice proxy, even though you might not necessarily have a need or a desire to get to the local playground, it constitutes something, an amenity in your neighborhood that you know you could conceivably walk to should you should you want to. Um, so I've used uh, a few Python packages to calculate the um, the shortest path from every uh, intersection in the street network to the nearest playground. And uh, that is displayed in those heat maps uh, on the right. Uh, so obviously, most of these uh, routing algorithms tend to operate on distance. So the one on the left is just uh, showing the uh, heat map in on the scale of meters. Um, but really, you know, a lot of this project was coming at it from a sort of citizen uh, perspective, you know, person who actually lives in the city. And I and I think, you know, most of us when we travel, we're not really thinking in terms of distances, we're thinking in terms of travel time. So a large part of this project has been about that conversion from uh, distance uh, of the route through to a travel time that you'd be looking at if you wanted to walk to the park or to the closest playground. And so that's what the one on the right is. It's a very simple conversion of just a five kilometer per hour. But really the meat of this project was um, converting from distance to a slope based a time. And so most of us are quite familiar with Tobler's hiking function, which takes in um, the gradient uh, of the slope that you're walking on, and it sort of calculates a speed. And obviously, uh, the higher the slope, the, the, the lower the speed. And, you know, inversely, the higher the slope, the greater the travel time uh, for you. Um, it's a bit contentious sometimes thinking about Tobler's these days, because it's a relatively old parameterization. Um, it's a few decades old. Um, and, you know, we, we do know that there's a lot of people with very different abilities. Um, and so some recent research, um, you know, uses uh, Strava data or um, they're using other types of um, crowdsourced um, movements of people doing things like cycling or walking, and they calculate sort of, a, they re-parameterize or even have new functional form equivalents of Tobler's. Um, I think, unfortunately, using uh, fitness data for this kind of understanding of local walkability, which is likely to, you know, contain everybody from uh, myself, who's reasonably fit, through extremely fit people, um, through to a grandmother walking with her, um, with her grandchildren or a parent with a pram and a young child, you know, those are very different sets of abilities. So it's hard to sometimes justify whether those reparameterizations are necessarily appropriate. Um, so, and that's something that, you know, would be a research project in its own right. Um, so for this analysis, I stuck with Tobler's because it's still relevant to calculate walkability and just accounting for hills. And that is something that we don't really see as much of in a lot of the, um, uh, walking analyses since most cities tend to be pretty flat. Um, and the main part of uh, this, this work was really not just doing those um, calculations of, you know, how long does it take you to get to your nearest playground, but how do you sort of summarize and communicate it? And 
while I love heat maps, um, and I'm sure many of us do, they are not that relevant if you're a citizen of that city. You actually want to find out, um, you know, what is walkability like where you live. And one nice way of summarizing those heat maps is some is um, using a statistical model. Um, and here I've used a Bayesian hierarchical model to um, fit effectively um, a, a single sort of normal distribution of the walkability of the walking times by suburb in the city. And so what you get is um, you get the, the, the mean and the standard deviation per suburb, but you also get this pooled average across all suburbs, which is a representation of the city. And those are the um, gray bars in the forest plots on the left. And once again, you know, you can um, look at the suburb that you're interested in and you can find out, oh, okay, I'm interested in Teado, which is an inner city uh, suburb that has a really sort of low average walking time to the nearest playground. And hey, it also has a very low standard deviation, which means the suburb, you know, is relatively close. All parts of the suburb are relatively close to a playground um, and it's easy walking. Um, so while people are doing these kind of things just naturally, why not just summarize that? Um, and so that's what the sort of um, uh, the summary on the right presents is just, yeah, based on the relative to the average for that suburb, you just create a sort of a human understandable summary for what walkability looks like. Um, and as you can see, it varies quite considerably. Um, you have some of the really hilly suburbs like Kandala, where I used to live when I went to school. Um, it's effectively poor walkability for most areas. And I can certainly say that me walking from my house to the bus stop was you know, not a fun walk um, and it wasn't even that far away. Um, so yes, that is the um, main part of my talk. I've written up all of the content at this uh, URL. So maybe I could post it in the chat. Um, it's got more contextual information if you're interested and it links to also the um, more detailed posts if you're more curious about how the modeling was done or how the um, travel times were calculated with accounting for hills. Thank you very much for your time.